It's his potential that people are interested in. Since that's Sondheim in musicals, he is the rock. Wait, he's English? Three, two, one, special noise. How are you and welcome to Josiah is Right About Film. And today we're going to talk about a movie called Tick, Tick, Boom, which is, uh, I've only talked about three movies on this podcast, but this is by far the newest one. And I imagine the newest one I'll talk about in the first season here as there's a lot of classic movies I want to visit with various people. And so I can vote for the Producers Guild as a member of the Producers Guild, obviously. And while I would have voted for uh, uh, Spider-Man No Way Home probably for Best Picture just out of personal preference and, and, and love from affection for that character and what they did with all those films, it wasn't an option. So my second choice became my first choice, which is Tick, Tick, Boom. And I actually talked about it on an episode of Most Extreme Ranking Challenge, which should be out. We're recording this a little bit ahead of award season and all that. So hopefully this movie wins for Producers Guild, which I don't think it will. Hopefully it wins for uh, Best Actor, which I think it has a shot for Andrew Garfield to win that one. And unfortunately, we'll talk about this a little bit more, it wasn't nominated for Best Picture, which is just uh, kind of a travesty in my book, but we'll talk about that more in depth. Because first I want to introduce you, the person I'm talking with this film about. So Ryan and I go way back. We go back to basically before we were born as our dads went to high school together. That's how far back we go. And officially we go back to what, second grade, Ryan? I think it was first, actually. First grade. Jeez, oh man, see? I'm like, but it wasn't kindergarten. I don't know. No, it wasn't. That I know. <laughs> so we were with Professor Van Horn, Ooh. by the way. So, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about a musical. And I thought, who do I know that's a PhD in chemistry? And that's why Ryan <laughs> is on this episode. But there's something we'll talk about at the very end, actually, that's a, a tease for a future thing that Ryan and I are going to do. But that's not <laughs> now. This is uh, Tick, Tick, Boom. So Ryan and I grew up together. And... Uh, one genre of film and thing in general that I have never been as into that Ryan has always been more into. Although in high school, I actually did musicals and musical theater because that was the closest thing to filmmaking at our school. I, I created the first uh, independent film study and I did, I did write my first horrible screenplay through that process. Uh, the base story I still stand by, but the script itself as ryan ryan knows there's footage i'll cut to of ryan and some of our other friends in high school actually reading some of that script in my parents driveway and in the my parents living room when we were uh seniors in high school in like the dead of winter and i think we were outside and it's like we're like why are we just this is going inside to film this but it was a scene that was set outside written to be on that location it was written for that but anyway that's uh, the, the, the the little tangents that we'll likely get on with a lifetime of friendship. But Ryan actually cares about musical theater. So why? I don't understand it, Ryan. I still don't get it. I don't really either. Um, I think I've just always been a music person. And to me, musical theater is just another form of music. And, and perhaps this will come up while we're chatting. Sort of the origins of pop music are sort of tied into musical theater. And so... I think I've always viewed music from musical theater as pop music and something that I could listen to and sing along to. And, and I'm sort of a musical person in general. I play a couple instruments, you know, growing up, I was in sort of chorus in elementary school and things, but I didn't do that in high school. I was in the band, as you know, um, but I, I just drawn to music and, and complex music and harmonies and things that sort of are showcased in musical theater and then the fact that it comes with a story and a production and all that stuff just is really cool to me and I really like sort of seeing the stories in that way so I, I've just always been a, a big musical theater person because of that. So if you had told that to me in like 10th grade I would probably have a different view on it that was a great uh, <laughs> response as to why because I guess I've always viewed it as as you know as not but I've always had this and again, Ryan knows this because, you know, he was there with the early inclination of, of Josiah as a storyteller. Uh, and I always had this sort of vague idea for what a musical would look like that I'd want to see. And I finally saw that musical and it was Tick, Tick, Boo. And I didn't. And, I, and it's funny because I wish 
this it, it's one of those things that oh and over the years I've, I've definitely leaned more towards musicals and things like that like as an adult I definitely changed but high school kid me like those suck I, I grew up from that like through college and growing you know just becoming an adult you see things in more than your like narrow child view uh hopefully <laughs> for most of us uh, not all of us unfortunately no <laughs> but with that I uh saw that uh that, that sort of the path of musical theater that's more than I thought it was. I just thought it was the kind of productions we did in high school that were just not appealing to me. But I realized it's so much more. And I'm also, what I was trying to say is sad to realize that this musical existed in yeah. the 90s when I, it could have been found by me. You know, in right. some way or form, it could have been discovered, like Tick, Tick, Boom, and we'll talk about the course of that. So real quick, we'll talk about the... Um, sort of the movie stats, the filmmakers yep. kind of thing. And then we'll get into um, a little bit of background on the sort of the trajectory of sort of from stage to theater, not in depth, yep. but a little bit. So directed by, directed by the great Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is on fire for like the last several years, like Hamilton, obviously he blew up, but he's been around a bit longer than that, making great things in musical theater that I had no yep. idea about. Yep. But thanks to like Moana, it's like, oh, he, I'm aware of him. And so uh, this is his first feature film, but it actually, if you look on IMDb, he has a credit for a film called Clayton's Friends from 1996 when he was in the 10th grade that he made with like a high school friend. And I saw it on, you know, some late night show. Oh, Jimmy Fallon. I don't watch, but I saw the clip of him. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I was looking for things about Tick, Tick, Boom. And he said he made it. It's like some kind of weird horror film. And he said at the time, IMDb didn't check sure. <laughs> so he was they just put it on themselves and he literally said i can't get it off imdb now so it's permanent but he Worse really did Wikipedia. make it yeah that was his <laughs> directorial debut in the 90s in high school which ryan suffered through a lot of similar productions and filmmaking things with me like ryan wasn't in the drama classes but i was in the drama classes so if i ever made a video i would just be my own group like, you know, right. we do a group project. I would be my own group, but then I'd pull in my friends who weren't in drama to be in my group. That was kind of the trick that it's I like did. like hanging out at your house on a Saturday. That was exactly. It. And we're just turning it as a school project instead of right. just watching it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, screenplay by, and I, and I could go on about what Lynn Monroe Miranda has done, but it's, uh, I hopefully, if you don't know, why are you watching this episode? Yeah, screenplay by, but thank you, regardless. Uh, Stephen <laughs> Levinson, and if you don't know, you're probably my mom, but who is watching? That's one thing I know. Uh, Stephen Levinson wrote the uh, screenplay. He did a lot of television, but most recently, Dear Evan Hansen. So another musical, which actually has a Pittsburgh connect connection because the director, Stephen Chomsky, is a Pittsburgh guy. So just, we are Pittsburgh guys. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see the map? Yeah, the map of Pittsburgh over there next to the Sentinel decorated Penny's uh, weird hats from school. Uh, produced by Brian Grazer and Ron Howard and Julie O and Lin-Manuel Miranda himself. Lin-Manuel Miranda started writing musicals. Basically, he saw Rent and that was kind of what told him, oh, people look like me. They, they do this thing. And 2008 in the Heights was his breakthrough in theater, which is crazy because then it comes out this year when he directs this film, which he did not direct in the Heights. And the same year, even more ironically, that um, West Side Story is so unnecessarily remade by Steven Spielberg. And, oh, I got to turn my page. My notes are on the wrong page here. There we go. And so, because part of what makes me sad is when I was prepping for this episode, I, assume, I just assumed this got nominated for Best Picture mm -hmm. because I think it's so good. And it was in the Producers Guild Awards like course, selection. Right, right. And it wasn't. And West Side Story was. Oh, my. And you cannot tell me that's a better movie. I said, it's just like the older people who are still in the Academy, like Steven Spielberg. And at the end, there was a thing. He's like, for dad. And I was like, of course. Like, <laughs> and, and he, and it's like Steven Spielberg, which is great, has been making movies about his childhood, his whole career, which is awesome. Great film. Some of the best films you'll ever see. And then now he's making the films of his childhood. And it's just not, it's not as good as the original movie. That's the problem. Like just watch the original movie if you want to see West Side Story. Right. And, and it's it's and it's well made and all those things. It's well shot and it uses great filmmaking with he, the techniques, but it's it also and it's and it's about like race. So you it's but it feels so irrelevant. Right. And I just couldn't believe that even though this movie is also set 
30 years ago now in the 90s, it feels so relevant to today. Mm -hmm. Just so on point of the life that I live now. Um, so it started as a rock monologue called 39, oh, like 30 slash 90, 30 over 90. I don't know how to say it. It's 30, 90. And later Boho Days. And that's from like the late 80s and like into 1990. And uh, he developed it as he performed it. It was basically a one man show. And then he slowly expanded it. And when it became Tick, Tick, Boom, that's when it became like the version we see in the movie with like a few people, you know, like the singers and the, that are like, you know, on the stage with him and the musicians, it sort of developed into that, uh, like more gradually. So it's kind of cool to like read a little bit about that. And the interesting thing to me was upon Larson's death, uh, in 96, I think he passed away. Um, yeah, that sounds right. When Rent came out, right? Like yep. the day before craziness, which the movie tells you if you don't know it. And I did know that. I knew enough about it to know that. I didn't really, I don't know that I even knew his name, but I did know the craziness. The, story. the guy who did it, unfortunately passed away <laughs> right. before he ever got to see it with a real audience kind of thing. Um, that it was actually developed by a writer named David Auburn. And he developed it further. And then it played in 2001. That's when uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Manuel Miranda saw it from what I've gleaned off of some things on the internet. And um, the film version was basically kind of a, an amalgam of, of that version plus some of the older versions and pulling songs here and there to kind of be from what I gather almost like the definitive non-Jonathan Larson version. You know, obviously if you were to see this in the early nineties when he was still performing it himself, that'd be the definitive version. But aside from him being in it, this is it. So you were aware of Rent. Were you aware of Tick, Tick, Boom as a show? Not at the time I was aware of Rent, but um, I, and I will give my, uh, disclaimer here, I am knowledgeable in mu musical yeah. theater. I am knowledgeable in Rent, but I will probably say things that aren't true. So people who watch <laughs> this, please don't get all fired up and leave comments. Um, I will do my best with my knowledge, but I don't have a PhD in musical theater. I have a PhD in chemistry. So anyway, um, I knew that there was sort of this Jonathan Larson, what I would call incomplete show. And and really it wasn't incomplete. It was just sort of the project by by way he was doing it was this one man show that then got developed into something that could be a show on Broadway. So I knew that there was this other thing that he had done. I didn't really know what the name was over mm -hmm. time. I sort of heard that it was tick, tick, boom, but I had never seen it, never heard anything about it. I, I just didn't follow up with it, but being a pretty big rent fan I, and knowing a bit about Jonathan Larson, I knew that it existed. So when I heard that it was coming out, uh, from Netflix, I was excited to see it and sort of yeah. learn more about him and learn more about that show, knowing not as much about like, what is it that I'm going to see on the screen relative to what happened in the writing process and the production of the show and, and sort of all of those different things. Yeah, it was interesting because even when I was like doing the research, I didn't do it extensively by any means because this is just a conversation and not like, you right. know, if you watch my other videos, those are very research driven pieces where I try to have things right. And I, I do here as well, but it's not like you said, we're, if we get things wrong. We're not, we just get things wrong because this isn't, this isn't a research paper. I, you know, as the <laughs> English person over here, that but with it, it I was a little confused I was like I wasn't sure that he ever performed it with other people it's I thought yeah. it was just a solo show but I'm not sure if that's the case um or not but I know that then it was expanded once he was he passed so there's different things there one thing that was really interesting to me though that the filmmakers uh Lin Manuel Miranda and the screenwriter uh Stephen Stephen Levinson when they were working on it they actually went to the Library of Congress to get his demos and stuff from mm. the old stuff. So it is, again, regardless, it's sort of the most comprehensive version of it. And then one thing that's really cool, so kind of jumping into, oh, one uh, thing before we get into it, like the production. So it was started production and was shut down after eight days because of COVID. So right yeah. in the mid middle of it, this film had the shut down. So that was like mid-March, and then it started up again in September. So, and then even before that, the craziest thing was when they approached Andrew Garfield to be in this, they're like, can you sing? And he's like, 
how long do I have? Well, like a year. He's like, I can learn to sing. And when I heard that, I heard that after I saw the movie, mm. I was shocked. Yeah. Because there's so many movies where you have great actors, like um, what's the Ewan McGregor one with Nicole Kidman? Uh, Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge. He's a great actor, not a great singer. No. Yeah. Not a great singer. Even the the uh, the the kid. What's the <laughs> the lead in West Side Story? He's yeah. a, he's, a, he's a good actor, but not and especially compared to the girl in that like when you right. have the scene she's like wow she's she was cast for her voice he was cast because he was in other stuff you know right whatever. And, yeah and he's a good actor but again not the singer and and that's okay you you some right, when you right, watch right. this kind of movies when you watch a movie musical and it's got a star in it you kind of give it a little leeway yeah, yeah. But you don't need to give any leeway to andrew garfield he's no. so good and i'm not a music expert like Ryan, by default on this show, would be the musical expert. <laughs> but I was so shocked when I learned that he didn't sing. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to like see him act and then learn about him. Because every time I see him in something, I find out that's not really him, right? So like, you don't really know who he is and you sort of see him in the first movie and you go, wait, he's English? And... Then I like saw him on Doctor Who as a guest <laughs> star, and I was like, he's really good in this. It's just like some random character, but like he just has this thing about him where he can be whatever it needs to be. And to hear him say, I had to learn to sing, I think he also learned to play piano, yeah, yeah better, right. maybe not like from scratch, but like it almost was like, yeah, of course he did. Like, I can totally see he doesn't know how to do this yet, but he'll learn and he'll be ready. And, you know, it'll happen because he's just one of those people that seems to be able to adapt and do things that are required of him as, you know, as an actor. Yeah. And one of the things like this, will we'll, we'll stay on the Andrew Garfield aspect okay. of watching him. One of the things that is always impressive. If you, if you study acting, I'd like not study acting. I've never studied acting, but studying actor's performance and you watch what they're doing against the other person being the showy one. There's certain points where like maybe someone's singing to him, the Susan character mm -hmm. or other characters when he finds out um, way, way ahead, when he finds out that uh, Michael has AIDS or HIV technically that he, the way he reacts to things with seeing very little, especially because Jonathan Larson as a character, it's kind of a showy character. Yeah. The yeah, personality yeah. is like, you know, not like over the top, but a little bit exuberant. Right, right. Like a word for it. But then when you see those subdued moments that the, when his not, he's not saying anything, he's reacting. That's where it's like, okay, please let this guy win an Oscar for this. He's so good. I don't know. And there's, it's some really good performances like Bradley Cooper. I think he's up against, I don't remember. Uh, Javier Bardem is great mm -hmm. in being the Ricardos. Have you seen that one? I haven't. No, it's, it's I need to watch it. It's surprisingly good. Well, you're yeah. you 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 and uh, Rachel or uh, Aaron Sorkin people, right? Because uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Rachel watched it. I just yeah. didn't watch it with her. Yeah. and she said the same thing. She was like, "I wasn't sure, but when I saw that Aaron Sorkin did it, I was like, oh, maybe I should watch it.'" She's like, "It's really good. You should watch it." It, it was like I was yet. so impressed. Like I did the the most extreme ranking challenge episode that I mentioned, and it wasn't in my top five, but I said there's just like a bubble of like three or four movies that I could easily, depending on my day and my sort of my mood that day, that would bump into the, that number five spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that episode, I picked the movie Belfast, but I could just have easily picked that. That was, uh, and, but anyway, point being, it's, I can see how it's hard to uh, uh, vote. And that's why like, you know, the actors who specialize in these things, but as a non-actor who appreciates what I think is a great performance, I do hope Andrew Garfield wins. And he's just, he's, he, he's the, my, my, the, the, my heart, is with him this year yeah, yeah so let's talk about the movie itself which we have been but one of the things i liked and don't and and there's a little bit of a, i'm torn between liking it and not liking it so i liked it in the way that it frames the film by entering it's like a vhs style frame so it's, hmm. it sets you back to the 90s which i liked but then i kind of didn't like when it tells you before rent before this before that right right like i didn't think we needed it at the beginning like I, I, yeah. I think it works at the end when it circles back to that framing device, and and then it's like talks about him, and then it shows some of the clips of real him as the credits right, roll. Right. I felt like it worked there, but at the beginning, I didn't think he needed it. Like he just, 
Yeah, it's one of those awkward things where like, who is going to be the audience for this movie? Is it going to be the people who know what it is and know about Jonathan Larson and love Rent and don't need that at all because they already know what's need, what is needed to be known coming into the movie? If you're sort of reaching the, the new crowd or sort of the general audience, I, I think they have a sense of what this is going to be about. And as you said, it doesn't add anything at the beginning, especially because the musical he's writing in the the musical, the musical within the musical is Superbia, which is not Rent. And then the next movie or the next musical he's working on is Tick, Tick, Boom. So Rent isn't even the yeah. musical until the end. So like to preface it by saying he wrote Rent, you're like, but not for a long time. Like, yeah. That's not relevant right now. It's about what happened before then so that you can talk about what he became, right? Because it, it's sort of shown in the movie that it's his potential that people are interested in. Yeah. And so leaving that out sort of lets the audience find that potential too if they don't know who he is and that he wrote Rent. So that at the end, it's almost like a reveal, like, oh, that's that guy? That's really cool. That show's great. I've heard about it. I've seen it. I've seen the movie, whatever. Instead of like, hey, by the way, this is what the end of the movie is going to be, right? Yeah. No, and, and again, but and it's almost like to we're 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 digging into that little bit, but it's 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 a very nitpicky thing when that's the biggest probably the biggest flaw of your movie. So to the movie's credit, oh, but one thing I did love about the beginning before I move on was at the 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 last line of the narrate the narration where it's like except for the parts that he made up, which were just great and clever, where it's it's just shows you it's it's this thing that's based on reality, but it's also blown up to tell a story, right. which is all of drama. And I'm working on a novel, which is based on my time as a paper boy. And it's populated by a bunch of real characters, real people that I delivered the newspaper to, but the story itself there's not, didn't right. happen. But there's moments in there that really did happen. Like there's a whole thing with the cops and stuff and that happened. What, why it happened was way <laughs> different than what's the story. But the stuff with the cops really happened. I was delivering right. a newspaper and there was a cop with a gun pulled out looking at me, not with a gun on me, like looking at a trailer down over the way. And I'm just like, drop the paper in the door. <laughs> the rest is all fabricated. So I really appreciated that as a writer and just that almost like, okay, it's okay. That's worth it for that. Not to jump to the end, but I also really loved how the movie itself ended based on that comment. Like the way he looks into the crowd and it's black because it started with that and parts are in his head. Like you have that sense of like, did he perform this like this? Were there people there? Is he just yeah. singing to himself like he always does? So it was like sort of a nice tie at the end to say like, this is how creative he was that like in his life, just every day was about being creative where you don't know that there needs to be an audience for him to be able to perform and do the thing that he does so well. Yeah, it's almost like he wants an audience because he's going to do it anyway. So he may right. have one, but if there's not an audience, like he's not going to stop. Like even though like kind of again at the end of the movie, he considers it and he doesn't. But so let's not get ahead of ourselves. But yeah, sorry. Just, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, my uh, like crazy man just, notes over here. It's not, it's, it's just, it's just only sequential because I watched the movie in order. One thing uh, that I did relate to. So I have a locked away in a drawer uh, science fiction novel that I wrote that's kind of like become a thing of personal baggage for other reasons that I'm not going to share now that Ryan's familiar with but it's funny because he talks about at the beginning of the film he talks about how he spent eight years writing his uh, superbia the science fiction which I think was like if that musical came out that's like the musical for me by the way I know. like that, how did it not I would watch it every day <laughs> but eight years is how long it took me to write that novel like not consist like straight through but stops and stops and starts from the first version to here and there I, I i realized that i'm like oh my gosh it was eight years to when i finally had like a complete version that just blew and i just didn't realize that until yeah, i did yeah. the math when that i watched connection. the movie because it's uh i think why this movie resonated with me is as an artist particularly one that hasn't had success in the way i, I hope to as a, as a creative writer that um you have that feeling of, you know, you're never gonna 
no one's ever going to read anything or see anything in this case of his of his stuff and he's working so hard at it so dedicated to it and will anyone ever care and and it's part of the lesson is you got to find the right thing and uh that i can obviously really relate to uh and so i and i feel like that's what makes this kind of more timeless than something like a west side story where obviously that's set in the 50s and it's still set in the 50s <laughs> it's like <laughs> which is like 70 years ago now come on <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm losing my train of thought because I, you know, have West Side Story in my notes. Yeah. Um, so what, let's, uh, one of the things that the, the, why the movie, um, part of why it's relevant is through the editing of the film, through the pacing of the film, through the use of dialogue and music. So, and these are things that, again, Ryan's the more musical of us with a background in music going, you know, like playing multiple instruments, growing up and all that. But neither of us are, you know, like we said, professionals in that field. But uh, he's an he's an informed amateur, and I'm the an uninformed, not amateur, I guess. But (laughs) I I understand filmmaking, so I I I like the way the musical techniques combined with dialogue. I really like the way a lot of the songs would segue you through things and move you through space and through from time and space and different settings in a way that if this were just a more traditional, if it were like a, a more traditional biopic where he's working on the musical, but it's not itself a musical, it wouldn't have had the same mm-hmm. poignancy where you wouldn't, and it wouldn't have had the flow. Cause the one thing I, I told Judy when I was watching it again last night prep for this was I'm surprised at how short it feels mm-hmm. because it's almost two hours and it just, but it just flows so well. I, I love the way, right from the first song the the you get the song and you get the setting of the stage and you get what he's going on it establishes character setting tone everything right away and it just gets you going really well and that's one of the things you know in screenwriting it's like can you get them the first 10 pages can you hook your audience right. kind of thing and or the first 10 minutes in screen time and this movie does that and then continues that flow so that's one of the things i was really impressed with filmmaking wise and also which again made it feel very relevant today even though again it's set you know i'm, I'm complaining spielberg's not making stuff from when you were a kid makes it from when i was a kid <laughs> but it feels more yeah. relevant because even though it's set in the 90s it's a the style of its contemporary to today right you know and i think what a lot of people who don't like musical theater complain about is there's to them sort of two styles of musical theater right there's one where there's a a, a play going on that has random music throughout it, right? And people just like burst into song and that's not real and it seems weird. Those songs sometimes progress the plot. Sometimes it's just like singing and it's not particularly helpful for driving the plot forward. The other kind is where they sing through the whole thing. So the plot is purposefully driven by the music, but people don't want to listen to people sing the whole time Right, that's very reminiscent of opera and yeah i was gonna say wasn't people, that sort of kind of right. almost, yeah technically like make it an opera because it's like you don't stop singing <laughs> right and and i think what jonathan larson does well and that is very obvious in this movie and how they've as you said edited and put this movie together is the the songs are there to help understand the character and drive plot almost at the same time like you can listen to songs and it's like sort of flashbacky and sort of emotional and sort of what's going to happen next that allows the audience to sort of follow that along. And I think really what he's known for and, and the, the thing that made him sort of change the modern musical theater sort of perception or sort of the subject matter and the style of music that he used. But I think And especially if you notice in this movie, like there are songs that he writes where there are pieces that have sort of the the regular rhythm and rhyming of music and poetry. And then there are other parts that like don't and they're like stream of consciousness type words and phrases. But as you said, like it resonates with you because you're like, that's how I would think through this if I were that character, right? It's It doesn't feel like the surreal place where people sing. It feels like, these people just express themselves in song and it's like talking except there's music involved 
And when the music is, is a little bit more upbeat and more rocky and more poppy, people like that because that's what they're used to now. And so that style of musical, I think, gets more connection from the general audience because they don't see it falling into one of those two other categories, sort of falls somewhere in between. Yeah, no, and, and, and that's probably why it appeals to me more than a normal musical. You know, like it took me, I mean, f- first of all, the West Side Story was like three hours long. I don't know how right. long it was. It took it took two, two nights to get through that. <laughs> so, but it's just that flow. Not the throw shade at Sondheim. It's a shade at Spielberg tonight. And I, and I love Steven Spielberg. I'll gush right. about no, him yeah. in other episodes, I'm sure. Um, but not about that movie. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking about West Side Story way too much on an episode of Tick, Tick, Boom. But it is interesting, though, that you have the Sondheim connection yeah. in the year where that movie is remade. And it is kind of interesting, though. It's like, wow, the movie was, you know, nominated for Best Picture in 1957 or something, whatever it right. was. The winner is West Side Story. Or I think that's 57 was like, maybe that was when it was on Broadway and it was the early 60s. Yeah, in I don't, I, I don't like roughly in that late 50s early 60s when West Side Story was uh you know from stage to uh to uh screen there we go yeah but it's just interesting then you have Sondheim as a character in this and it's really cool because he just passed away correct was that yeah Yeah, uh, less than a year ago yeah it was like or right when the yeah yeah just pretty crazy all the the connection that you kind of don't necessarily expect that's within these things you know we have all the Lin-Manuel Miranda stuff and then connecting it to Stephen Sondheim yeah. uh, and it, it was just cool to see him as a character because even to me as a super outsider not a huge fan of musical theater I know what he did right even if right. I haven't seen it I know his stuff it's like how like you know if you're not a, into wrestling you know who Hulk Hogan is you know who right. the right. is you might not have ever seen them wrestle, but you know who they are. And I, I said, that's Sondheim in musicals. He is the rock. <laughs> <laughs> and which connects back to musicals. And this right all connected. <laughs> but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, which was crazy. I, I, another thing I saw Lynn Mo Miranda talking about how he learned how to write for the rock for Moana by listening to his old wrestling promo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're like a real rhythm to them. <laughs> so it's that's funny. I, I remember our friend Frank had on CD the entrance music where it's yeah. like <laughs> Rock says, if you see <laughs> that was his entrance music where he's he docks and but kind of like a rap, I guess. So that was yeah. technically his first song, I, I suppose. But but what was really cool again, where you they the the movie sets up that they it's Sondheim the reverence they have for him and he's like this even then I mean obviously then he was super well established he at that point he'd been the guy for 30 years yeah and yet still looking to encourage and, and and support young artists and that's what's really cool to see that he showed up and yeah. gives helpful feedback and it's like well it's good and it knows what it is and you know who you are as a writer, but it can be more, it can be better. And, you know, that was one of the big pivot points of the movie is that song where he's like, you need a song for, was it like the Elizabeth character, the Furby, yeah. the, the female lead in that. You need that song. It's like the turning point kind of song where, and, and it's cool too, because that's where the, the Sondheim character by uh, Bradley Whitford, I believe, right? Yeah. He, yep. he, explains to you a bit about musicals that I might not have gotten and I've been in musicals but <laughs> I was there really yeah, I was to say it's about getting the production done it's not a yeah. deep thing <laughs> I, I student directed I operated the video camera right <laughs> so uh but it was cool to see this one of those people that you would view as sort of a mythological sort of figure grounded and real and just a guy that himself was a writer who thought about story and you kind of when people become so revered you forget that even Jonathan Larson I'm I'm sure since his death that he became that too and these these things kind of help that but yet it's a movie about grounding him and who he was and just this person struggling to find himself as he turns 30 as Ryan and I just turned 40 we're 10 years beyond that but any of those ticking clock you know roll over from a nine to a 
three zero yeah. or four zero, it, it it adds a little bit of like whoa in your life. Regardless, it's when I uh, my birthday was just a few weeks ago as we record this, and my brother goes, "I thought we we're thirty, turning 38. <laughs> I'm like 38 I'm like it's like just do the math on how much younger i am now. right <laughs> um so but it that the, my dog is barking upstairs and he that dog never barks he's barking he knows i'm on bark of course the he barks now when i'm trying to record something so but i just really thought that and that's one of the things the movie did throughout is it made it grounded so that but kind of getting back to what you were talking about, the way the, the music functions in the movie is you could you could see it as uh, almost like part of why it works is, and this is kind of the way I always want to do the musical where it's like in that person's head. Yeah. And so then everything explodes. And the diner scene is a great example of that, where it's just this crazy chaos and the stress and the tension is re- like really good filmmaking there where the tension builds the noise and the customers like ding, ding. Right. And it's cool, though, because it's then it starts to get rhythmic. Just, right. And you don't realize like, oh, and then that like stop it's moment silent. and then yeah. it goes into the musical number that becomes this big like show stopping type of number that you would see in a musical and, and that's like the fantasy in his head. And then it's back to, he's still in that reality. Yeah. And that song and the way they did the production of it, as I just saw, is intentionally uh, uh, an homage to Sondheim. So in the movie, they're all watching Sunday in the Park with George on mm-hmm. PBS. And PBS should show more musicals. And I completely agree. I used to watch them all the time growing up. Um but the I would style be like, of music, I would be, I would real quick, I'd be like, ah, why isn't yeah. Doctor Who on? <laughs> I know. <laughs> the style of music of that song, I think it's called Sunday, um, and the way the characters sort of move about that mini stage of the diner is very reminiscent of how the sort of George Seurat painting gets made in Sunday in the Park with George. Like the music sounds the same, the, the movement of the actors on the stage into positions in the painting so that when the song is over, it looks like the, mm. the painting from George Seurat. So like they move about the diner in that way so that at the end, they're all like framed in a particular way in his head, right? Because as you just said, like the, the way that it builds is you're seeing inside of his head how he copes with that stress or how he sort of uses that to motivate his creative process but i love that that song and that scene sort of call back to sondheim who has this very important role as a character and as a person in the in the movie and um it it's sort of interesting that you know the jonathan larson character says sondheim wrote his first show when he was only 37, right? I think that's right. I think 27. And 27, yes, sorry, thank you. I know that part of the point was that he wasn't 30 yet. 30, right, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Um, but what little I know, he really only wrote the lyrics to West Side Story. Leonard Bernstein was the one who wrote the music and and mm-hmm. I don't know if he wrote the book or if someone else did or if someone I think the, the book, book was like whoever directed the, film. yeah, that was from just, just like research, you know, looking some things up when I watched Spielberg versions. So right. I, but, have, I actually have the original, uh, the the original Broadway recording on vinyl. Oh, nice. We do have that. So <laughs> nice. Rachel's mom has it too, I think somewhere. Um, but Sondheim was an up and coming musical theater writer. And I don't know who, whether it was the director or producer of the show said, I have this project do you want to be a part of it and introduced him to Leonard Bernstein and he got to write for West Side Story. So it was almost like he was paying that forward, right? That he's showing up to these things for Jonathan Larson. He's giving him this feedback because that's how he got into the business, right? And that he wants to be that mentor in a way to help. And I, I meant to look this up but I'm really curious, the phone message he leaves at the end sounds like Stephen Sondheim's voice and not Bradley Whitford's voice. So I'm curious if that's like the actual recording of the phone call, because I wouldn't be surprised if that was like something that got saved, much like mixtapes and, and you know vinyl records and all those things like that they had or 
that maybe Sondheim had recorded ahead of time if it was before he had passed. But it, it just doesn't sound like Bradley Whitford's version of Stephen Sondheim in that recording. I hope I hope you're right there. But and in, in again, they did go to the Library of Congress to get the demo right. other things. So if that's going to exist anywhere, I would imagine that it would be part of that. And and of course, like if Stephen Sondheim called me to say a very well number, <laughs> I would keep that recording. You know, now it would be a voice exactly it's like video. if George Lucas called you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm. <laughs> I'd be like, George, can we talk about Steven Spielberg? I, I joked with Judy yesterday. I said, that'd be like me when I'm in my 70s saying, you know, I'm going to remake Star Wars. I really need to remake Star Wars now. <laughs> in basically the exact same way. I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to remake it so it exactly. looks pretty. <laughs> um, so let's uh, sort of segue towards the end of the film. Um, the... I mean, we could talk and break down the songs a lot more. Oh, one of the things I want to talk about before the end, though, that I really loved was we talked about, since we're transitioning to the end, it's framed around watching Tick, Tick, Boom. Right. And we're, we're, you know, we start with that and then we see it again at the end. But the great thing is you have the, the, these moments throughout where just when you, it like almost feels like it's, you forget that it's like from the framing yeah. of the stage, it cuts back to it. I agree. Yeah, so that was awesome. Watching it again, how well timed those were. Mm-hmm. Just, you're kind of like in this thing, and then it like cuts to like Jonathan Larson, and then he says something clever and interesting, you know, and like within right. it relates to the previous thing, but then sets up the next thing. And it was so that part was so well done. And that's one of the things where credit to uh, Stephen Levinson and and Lin Manuel Miranda for making that work. And then obviously the editing, this is nominated for uh, editing for the Academy. Oh, nice. so I really, really hope it wins that. It's up against like things like Dune and Spider-Man. So those are tough movies to beat. Yeah. But I think this, this editing is superb, probably against West Side Story. I don't know. I don't know if it is or not, but. <laughs> and the thing is. that I really liked about that too, is it was often another character that was speaking or singing at that moment when it cuts back. So it like reminds you that he's telling this story not we're watching his life unfold, right? That it's this back and forth between he lived it, but he's also telling it. And, yeah. and that, that disconnect sometimes we forget about because we get caught up on what's going on. And that sort of really well edited transition sort of brings you back to, oh, wait, no, really what we're hearing is his telling of his life, even though we're watching his life sort of unfold. Yeah, and then it's really cool. There's times where then it'll cut through like, Uh, or back and forth like it's almost like like I said it can bend time and space so Mm -hmm. put them in one space versus another like an earlier song when when Michael gets the fancy apartment it's like the like aggressive (laughs) and then it's like and then they were they reprise that later in a different way with the music but it's like that that conflict of the space but it also allows them to be go back and forth from two spaces that they couldn't realistically be in so that it works and then uh, it does it really well in particular with the Susan stuff where there's times where Vanessa Hudgens character, like particularly when finally she sings the song and yeah. in, but also it does it two different points. This, the, there's a point slightly before she sings the song, the song about relationships where it's like her, him, you know, sitting yeah, with yeah. Vanessa and they're like really stiff and like, it's a great song about relationships. Is, yeah. Like if I told you what I was afraid of, then you'd know I was afraid. Like and it, it's right, so right, good. Right. Andrew Garfield's so good. And Vanessa Hudgens is so really great in this movie too. Yeah, I didn't she go was. through like the cast. I forgot that. So uh, props to a lot of good people. <laughs> we talked about Andrew Garfield alone, <clears throat> but it's not just him by any means. Uh, and Robin De Jesus or De Jesus, how you pronounce his name, forgive me, but he was great as Michael. Yeah. He's like a feeder guy. So, but the way it, that, the, getting back to the last song, the, the Elizabeth song, whenever, you know, the thing in Sondheim is there and every, you know, and they're all, and she goes up to sing and it, it has her singing. And then it's like in his mind again, it's like, so it bends that wall. You're like, wait, he's telling the story, but within the telling the story, right. The mind takes him elsewhere. And so that it's very cool and meta. And I, and I like that, that it flows like to another time within another time. So it's right. like, because there's the framing device of the tick, tick, boom stage, the theater that he's telling you this story from. And as it's happening, it goes within his mind. And then like Susan sings, but it's cool then too, because then it comes back to, uh, 
I forget the actress names. Uh, Shipley, the I, Alexandra uh, Ship. Yes, exactly. I looked it up. Yeah, Storm. Uh, in <laughs> late, like the more recent X Men movies. Yeah, but she, you know, and then it'll be between her singing and Vanessa Hudgens, but then she's singing to Andrew Garfield, and that's one of those moments where he's just taking it in and like almost right. weeping. Great performance as like he's just listening and he's and he's like realizing what he's put her through to try to do his thing and. I just really thought that that was really great, but then it gave two performers a chance to shine and sing that song. Where you, right, Nessa right. Hudgens gets some, and then uh, Alexandra Shipley, right? Yeah, Ship, Ship. Alexandra yeah. Ship. So she, you know, gets the other it, part of that, and and it's a great song, and it pulls together like the emotion of Tick, Tick, Boom when it's a so, song from Superbia, I think. <laughs> right. You know, like but right. in reality, it's probably not, but it is. You know, but it's. And it's cool how that's like that focal point of he needs that song, needs that song to like make this thing work. Right. And not just the show, his life. Yeah. And so, uh, which inadvertently kind of brings us to sort of the end and the real power of the movie where it's a successful presentation. Everyone's calling to say, oh, I love that. And then again, Judith Light. She was great. Like, I was to Judy, I'm like, you watched Who's the Boss, right? It's like, oh, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> and, There's so many great people that are just randomly in yeah, this. And, yeah. No, exactly. And she, when she says that, everyone's raving. That Jonathan Larson, that Jonathan Larson, I can't wait to see what he does next. So yeah. it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's what you want. And then it's like a, like a knife in your heart. Like, I see your talent, but... I keep this project. I can't sell it to anybody, but right. just buy <laughs> <laughs> um, and she says, uh, I wrote the quote. So, but I might be getting it wrong. You know, you're started, you start writing the next. And he's like, well, what do I do? He just, what do I do? Everything. Yeah. Cause that's the thing too. When you work on a project, you know, working on a novel that I'm nearly finished with and having a previous one that I won't share with the world at the moment and multiple screenplays and things like that. And even short stories you put as a writer, you put all of yourself into it. Uh, and some projects more so than others. And this was clearly a lot of him as my current novel was a ton of me. Of you, right. It's set in the mid, it's set in 1996 in Pennsylvania. So it's like, it's connected to this as it can be without being connected to this. Right, right. Um, so you have all of yourself in it. So when it doesn't get accepted on some level, it is devastating. Yeah. It really is. And especially when it's perceived as a success too, where right. it's even harder to kind of stomach. And she says, well, he's like, what do I do? He said, you start writing the next one and on and on. That's what it is to be a writer. You keep throwing them against the wall and hope eventually one of them sticks. And that's really what it is. You just, you, yeah. you have all these things in your head and you got to get them out of your head and hope that the world connects with a few of them, you know, like we can't all be Sondheim and right. have, you know, all these <laughs> epically amazing musicals, but you hope that maybe one of my things, one of my pieces, one of my stories will connect with someone out there other than my mom. <laughs> <laughs> In your experience. So like when I watch this, I have a, a, a perception because I don't, I'm not a creative person. I don't work in creative arts there's this perception that he works on it so long and he works on it so hard that he wants it to be so right that he gets that big check and it is going to be produced because he wants it to be done by 30. Do you feel that same sort of thing? Like you've got to do the first one so well you know, so that you can get started on the next one instead of you got to do a bunch of creative things and one of those creative things is going to work. It's yeah, you're right. And it's really that, that it's the latter that usually works. But at the same time, you at least me and why I can relate to it is I I want it to be perfect. And there's times mm -hmm. where I won't share it with the world because I don't see it as perfect. And that's why George Lucas keeps tinkering with Star Wars. Well, he did when he owned it. Right. That same reason it's like I gotta tweak it. I want it to be what I what I had in my head completely, and it's never quite gotten to there mm -hmm. for him. And that's the same, like that same sort of logic applies to myself in a different way where it's not ready to be shared, you know, and, and it's, uh, and it's, it's not, even if it's not done, it's like, it might be whole enough that someone could read it and be like, no, I get it. I get what's here. Even if I don't have every right, single right. piece of it. And the funny thing is the other thing with that time clock, I was trying to finish the draft of this novel before I turned 40. I didn't get there. I was yeah. disappointed in myself for not getting there. 
And then I was like, it's okay. Like, cause I've written through to the end, but I have a few things like it's so it's technically kind of got there, but not really. Right, it right. really bothered me. Cause there's a few things I still, I know I added two chapters further back as I wrote through. And then I need to sort of rewrite the last couple mm-hmm. chapters since I added those chapters. Right, right, right. Yep. Flow and to make sure everything flows together since that. But it's that same thing where I like I had that clock set and I didn't get it. So it was I was disappointment. And that's right. the thing that this is framed around his birthday. And it ends on his birthday. His birthday. Right. And and it's just what I loved about it though is that it just brings it down. It's just some friends. Especially like that's the part where, as you know, now we're both dads with our families and your twenties, you're like, it's what friends was about as much as I don't like that sitcom. It's that idea that when you're in your twenties, your family is your friends, right? The people you're around. And, you know, that was certainly me. I was that time of my life in LA. Oh, I, by 30, I met Judy, but it was, you know, we were married in the late 20, my late twenties. So most right. of my twenties was pre my, you know, wife and then eventually kids. So I, really can relate to that in that way but also now but even if it's not that like my birthday was just me with my kids and my wife just a little just Mm -hmm. us together you know and that's just that's what I wanted and that's kind of you just want to be around the handful of people whatever it is that you care about the most in part because as Ryan knows he's on one coast and I'm on the other even though he's in the midwest right now yes (laughs) from a lovely hotel room in Chicago (laughs) taking advantage of the extra hour (laughs) Yes, exactly. Because <laughs> the, the time change is, yeah, can be struggle because we're like, you know, coordinating yeah. when uh, my kids are going to sleep. And yeah. So any final thoughts on Tick, Tick, Boom, Professor Van Horn? I mean, I really liked it. I thought it was really great. I, you know, I don't watch as many movies anymore. I miss the times where we would go see basically every Oscar nominated show, also, movie 20s, right? yes, in our 20s. Thing. Uh, we would always be late because it was my fault, but um, like to me, it was just a love letter to Jonathan Larson. Like it was an opportunity for people who have been impacted by him either because of the musicals that he wrote or because they knew him or, or whatever the case might be. It was a way to sort of showcase who he was and what a great person he was. And I think that's why so many people were involved that it was just a way like there's a bunch of like really random mini quotes throughout the movie that are like directly from Rent. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if they were written into Rent because that was his experience and, you know, Rent was the thing that he knows. Or if the, you know, the production team put those in to be little call outs so that people would see those little Easter egg. Like yeah. it would just screamed Jonathan Larson from top to bottom right and so it it felt like these people just wanted to say like you were great and we lost you too soon and this is our way of honoring you and thanking you and sort of making you a big deal because you didn't get a chance to be a big deal and to me that was just as powerful as the movie right it was just this idea that this person meant so much to this family of friends in a way that they wanted to be able to, to showcase that to the world because why wasn't this movie made up until now, right? You sort of pointed out, how did you not know about this musical yeah. for so long? And, and now it's out and Rent is 20, what do we say, 96? So it's like, I don't want to do the math. Closer to 30 than 25. Anything. Yeah, exactly. Like there's plenty of time where Rent was popular and this could have happened it's, it wasn't a particularly complicated, you know, production. So it's not like the technology wasn't there or, or that they were waiting for something. It just felt like it was time that, you know, the folks involved said, I, I really want to do this and I want to do it for him. And, and so the way they made this movie was about him. And the fact that they show those, like homemade movies at the end of him doing the things that were basically literally in the movie you just Mm -hmm. watched. And as you mentioned, it started with the VHS thing, which sort of sets you back to the nineties, but also for folks who, you know, didn't know him or sort of interacted with who he was through rent sort of had always seen these home movies of him to know who he was and what he was like. 
So it, it, it was a nice tie-in that like that was going to be a theme throughout the movie because for a lot of us, that's the only way we knew him, right? From those videos that we see at the end where he's in the Moon Dance Diner, when he's behind backstage at Rent, when he's at these, you know, different parties and things. And so like that got directly translated sort of literally in the scenery and the acting in the movie and also the way they edited and, and sort of infused that VCR home movie style into different scenes and, and different aspects of the movie. So it, I, I really liked it and I loved the music and uh, it was really fun to watch and I'm glad we're talking about it. But to me, it was just sort of on another level where these people were just excited to do this thing about him to honor him and remember him. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Someone who never got to be celebrated in their success that can right. finally be celebrated, you know, almost what, 25, 30 years after his death. Uh, so thank you, Ryan, for joining me on our episode about Tick, Tick, Boom. Uh, again, this is my choice for literal, I vote for the Producers Guild Award. <laughs> this was the one I voted for. You, The way we do it for Producers Guild, there's 10 options and you rank them by number one through 10. So this was number one for me. And well, Spider-Man would have been, but it was not an option on right, the, exactly. you know, right the in. ballot. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, I want to thank Ryan for being my friend for, our whole lives, years. basically. Yeah. <laughs> I, thanks for having um, me. This was yeah, great. If anyone should be able to do math on this show, it's the PhD in chemistry, and not yeah, that I no. just has a master's in writing at that. Yeah, that's great. Well, my arithmetic math. is yeah. terrible. <laughs> so, um, but uh, thank you, Ryan, for being here. Uh, if you're listening to this, you can find the video on YouTube. Uh, if you're on YouTube with video, you can find us uh, on Spotify and Apple now. I am now officially on Apple and all these other podcast platforms with uh, our lovely voices ringing in your ears. And we have one more thing to sort of tease you, Ryan, and being that he is a PhD in chemistry, there's a show called Breaking Bad that some of you may have heard of that was popular a few years ago. So Ryan's never seen it, but he is a PhD in chemistry and he's Mm -hmm. just an informed enough person about film and television that I think it was a good conversation to listen to. And I enjoy talking to him. So we are going to look at Breaking Bad episode by episode with probably some special caveats here and there. I have some ideas, but we're going to just start from the beginning, go all the way through it. So be sure to check that out. We haven't named it yet, but we're going to do a Breaking Bad podcast. But for now, just thank you guys for watching and thank you for joining me, Ryan. Yes. Thanks for having me. This was great.